So how do you find malware that doesn't leave a trace? I heard you got something about fileless malware you want to let us know about? Yeah, so uh, so I, I came across this story, and I know we've done stories on different types of fileless malware. Fileless malware is clearly not something new. Um, but this story sort of caught my eye because it's talking about the, the challenges of detecting fileless malware. So if we think about our traditional protections with antivirus, um, it kind of requires some kind of a file to be analyzed, something present that gets executed, run. Uh, but uh, what the adversaries have started doing is thinking about ways of never even having that file to be analyzed. It seems to be gaining popularity because of how hard it is to detect, obviously. Um, and this kind of goes into the things that make it difficult to detect fileless malware today. So the first one that they have is analyzing fileless code in an OS agnostic method. So they're talking about like traditionally, we have when you've got tools today and vulnerabilities, they're usually against some particular application, some particular OS, right? And you've got things that you can target in terms of your defenses based on what you know about what that particular vulnerability is actually targeting. In this case, what you have is you, you've got nothing that's on the disk. The sky basically is the limit. So you can't really take your, your analysis and break it down into a single OS or a single application, right? Um, the second thing that they're talking about is identifying and analyzing concealed and obfuscated code. So you could spend a ton of time looking through your logs to find PowerShell that's being used across your, your, your network but now you've got it running obfuscated. Another level of complexity that people don't realize when they're dealing with fileless malware. Um, the, the third one, detecting a broad spectrum of fileless attacks with no impact on network and host performance. You know, again, something that is not showing up, right? No, no, no on disk, and for the most part, it's not going to cause a blip on your radar when you've got a, you know, let's say a, a targeted attack. Another problem with the fileless malware stuff. Uh, determining if, uh, if recovered code will execute benign or malicious operations. This one's talking about uh, benign applications and processes using uh, scripts for legitimate purposes. So you've got a ton of scripts that normally run, let's say on a, on a Windows OS, that are run and they're legitimate. How do, you dis how do you distinguish between legitimate scripts that are running that maybe PowerShell is kicking off from non-legitimate? Um, and then the last one that they have is detecting threats in real time. Real time is another problem, you know, again, because of the methods that you have today of, of collecting the logs, trying to uh, find this stuff in real time as you're collecting the logs is very hard. You know, I think one of the biggest challenges with Detecting fileless malware is a lot of detection mechanisms. They rely on looking at something, and that something is a file. And so I recently had this experience where um, people were asking me, hey, can you give me some samples of something that we should be on the lookout for? Some new malware family, something that we need to make sure we detect absolutely. And I said, yeah, we need to detect fileless malware. And they're like, well, great, give me a sample of that. <laughs> I was like, there's no sample. I can't give it to you because it's fileless. There's no actual code that you can give that they could run. Uh, it's all kind of this uh, forensics that you have to do or um, piece together the malware from different parts of memory. One of my thoughts on this is about, you know, it staying resident in the registry. I mean, there's got to be a method like the registry, you know, an open shell within there, a couple of keys, lines, uh, whatever, to keep it persistent. So after the machine is rebooted, it's not wiped out. Um, the registry is, you know, is a prime example uh, or is a prime thing to use there. Um, 
how to detect something that could be popped anywhere in a regis- registry is is a tedious huge task the the one thing that i did you know as i was researching this this particular story you know i went off and figured out like what so what are other people using as defenses against fileless malware and what i found was actually kind of surprising because what i find what i find is is that people tend to not be tackling the actual problem itself it's how does the problem propagate on your network Today, the best way to do protection against this is to actually stop the vectors that is used to get the fileless malware into your environment, which means now doing protections better at the email side of the house and at the, at the web side of, you know, so doing protections at the, uh, you know, at the, at the browser in essence.